everyone, in this hand history, I'm coming at you from day three of the win $3,500 buy-in, three million guaranteed main event. This had a very slow structure. I want to say that this is the first level of day three. Um, we're getting kind of close to the money. Uh, we're, I want to say at this point, it's like, 147 left with 134 paid so in this hand history uh my opponent in this hand is on the button it is big blind 6k he has about 300k to start the hand i have him covered i have about 420k folds to his button and he opens with the small blind sitting out and i have the king of diamonds and the jack of clubs in the Big one. We're going to look at what his opening range is and then what my response is supposed to be. So we are close to the money. We're technically near the bubble, on the bubble, but it's going slow. So even though we are on the bubble, probably won't hit the money for a while. Because of that, I think his opening range is probably going to be pretty close to this 53%. Um, I would maybe expect to say lose like these types of hands. Um, but I would expect him to open pretty much everything else here for the most part. Maybe he's as tight as like 45%. Maybe he's like folding these. Maybe he's folding like these and folding like that. Uh, but I would expect him to be somewhere around there. So we're still going to be opening pretty loose. Now my response to him, as you can see here, I do get some shoves, which I actually don't mind taking some of these jams. Um... Yeah, I, I really don't mind these shoves. Uh, it's very hard for him to have that many calls. It's like all of his calls are just over pairs. So if he's only really calling like nines plus maybe ace king, um, these jams, they just get to print chips. Whether or not they actually make dollars though, I they should. I cover by enough where when he calls, I can still fold my weight in the money. No problem. So these should all make a decent amount of money. So I guess I'm okay with taking these shoves. My king jack here, as you can see here, I am largely supposed to call, but I do occasionally get to three betting. And in game when he open, I did strongly consider three betting. The issue I had with it is, I think when I three bet, his calling range is very, very, very tight. And if I just call, I keep in a lot of dominated hands that I'd much rather have in there. You know, I get to, if I flop a top pair or whatever, it's going to be very easy for me to win pretty decent sized pots. Also, if I keep his range pre-flop loose, it's going to make it a little bit easier post-flop for me to run bluffs. And I do have a good candidate to run bluffs because I'm going to block some of his strongest hands. So while technically I could 3-bet this pre-flop, I think that would be a significant mistake. So that being said, I called his open. So pot size of the flop is 30k. The flop is the king of spades, the five of hearts, and the four of diamonds. So obviously here, I have a very easy check with my king jack. And on this flop, I would expect in theory world, he's probably supposed to be c betting here, maybe say 85% of the time, give or take. He's probably largely supposed to go quarter pot, but he probably does get some upsizes. Um, the five four is pretty dynamic. Um, it, in terms of how my big blind range interacts with it. So he probably does get to upsize a decent amount here, maybe 10 to 20%. So let's look at that quick. Uh, looks like he gets 15% check back. So I nailed that. Largely going quarter pot, nailed that. He doesn't really get that many upsizes. That's a little surprising. Um, like I said, I, I, I do think this is, is not a bad spot to upsize, but I guess it's not quite dynamic enough. So maybe if say, maybe it's like, Six, seven, we're gonna see a decent amount more of two thirds pot. At seven, eight and high, we're definitely gonna see way more two thirds pots. So in game, he ended up continuation betting essentially a third pot. He bet 10K into 30K. Um, so we're going to say that he see bet this 25% pot. My response to this is probably, I'm probably going to be folding about 35 to 40% of my range. I'm probably going to be check raising about 15 to 20 percent of my range and calling the rest and most of my check raises are going to be small i would assume yep folding about 31 percent calling about 45 
check raising about 22%. And let's look at King Jack here. We have a very easy check raise for value. Now, we're kind of close to this money bubble. And the min cash is actually fairly large. $3,500 buy-in min cash was $8,200. But it's been going very, very, very slow. Also, my opponent here, he is a very good theory player. He's a Euro. Um, his name is Gregor. I've been playing with him a decent amount the last month or so. Um, I thought he's played very, very well. So he is a theory guy who probably doesn't care super much about this min cash. Probably cares enough that, you know, he's going to be playing relatively in line, but he's probably not going to be way, way, way overfolding to me, at least on flop. So I think because of that, it's really important that I just take this king jack for the value that it is and use it as a check raise. Also, the fact that he's played enough with me, he probably knows that I'm also a theory player and that I tend to be fairly aggressive. So we should recognize that I'm going to be applying a lot of pressure in this type of situation. I'm probably going to be, not only am I check raising this 22%, but I'm probably check raising a higher percentage than this, or at least very similar to this. I'm probably going to be going for bluffs a lot more often than what I should be and applying lots of pressure. Good spot for me to apply pressure. So in theory world, I should be check raising this, but also the actual situation perceptually I'm going to be bluffing a lot here which means I get to push my value so I check raise my king jack and he calls look at the type of range he's supposed to call with though I mean queen eight with a backdoor draw uh, queen six with a backdoor draw jack eight with backdoor draw jack nine with backdoor draw ten seven backdoor draw so the way I think his range is different here than, than it is in Solver is I don't think he's going to be calling all of these 10 queen jack highs with backdoors. Um, I think everything else, is, or nine highs with backdoors, I think everything else is pretty reasonable. Um, I think he's largely going to be calling these ace highs. I think he's largely going to be calling anything that has a pair or a straight draw. So I think he's going to be calling all of his king x and all of his pocket pairs. Um, definitely all of his best ace highs. And then of course he's pairs plus a wheel ace highs. I think all that stuff's very reasonable. I wouldn't necessarily expect him to have ace eight, um, ace seven or ace six, but you know, I could see him calling ace queen in full, ace jack in full, ace 10 in full, no problem. So that's how I think his range continues on this flop. So when he calls and the turn is a seven of hearts adding a backdoor flush draw, my king jack, I get to bet this for value super duper duper happily as you can see here i get to largely go uh two-thirds pot as a size here with king jack um my combo did not block the turned flush draw um, which to me makes it even better of a candidate to go for a barrel because it makes it way more likely that my opponent has those types of flush draws and i want to upsize because of that because i get to win bigger pots so for all those reasons, King Jack here on the turn, very easy bet, and really important that I go two thirds pop. So that's what I did. I didn't really like pick up on any tells or anything like that. Um, I thought when he called my flop check raise, I couldn't pick up on anything on the turn. When he called, I couldn't really pick up on anything. So in my mind, I don't think he has any traps or anything like that. I feel as though if he did, maybe I could have seen something, but I have like no alarm bells going off. I have no reason to believe that I don't have the best hand at this point. And if we're looking at what his range really looks like, he doesn't really have that many ASX in it. Um, he does have these like nut flush draws. Um, he does have these, you know, like some of these wheel draws, some of these like, you know, 4X, uh, A6 when he does get here with it, um, A7 when he does get here with it. Um, but largely he has like these pairs. Um, something to note is I actually think these queens, jacks, tens, and nines, I would expect them to call on turn. I would be fairly surprised actually if they folded turn pretty much ever. Um, I think he has a lot of these types of hands. So I think the range at which he gets to the river has a lot, lot, lot of hands that I beat and not very many hands that I lose to on this river offsuit ace. 
And as you can see here with my King Jack, I am supposed to be betting and I am supposed to be going fairly large, especially considering that I think I'm highly incentivized to have lots of bluffs. And because of that, I think he's going to find a lot of bluff catches. I think I get to go for value here pretty comfortably. The question is, is what size should I be betting? Because my hand, I can go 10% pot, I can go quarter pot, and I can shove it for value a very small percentage of the time as well. And I thought in game that he would perceive me as having a lot of bluffs here. Because of that, I thought that I could go fairly large for value fairly comfortably. So I went two thirds pot in game. I bet 135K into a pot size of 210K. Looking back at this, I think I was too greedy. I mean, if, if we can see here, well, yes, my King Jack does get to bet two thirds pot, very small percentage of the time. Largely it's going either quarter pot or 10% pot. I do think two thirds pot is way too large though. So I do think I fucked up this hand by going that big. So, end result, I went 135 and he called with, if we look at what his calling range is supposed to be, even versus the shove here, he does have a lot of worse, uh, worse hands, but he ended up calling me with ace six, which if we look back at flop, the ace six hand was a partial fold and we're, and he's under some ICM pressure. I really, I did not think you'd ever have ace six. I didn't think you'd ever have like ace queen or ace jack or ace 10 or ace nine or ace eight. I thought the only ace X's that I lost to were ace X of hearts, uh, maybe ace deuce, ace three, maybe ace four, ace five, ace king, pocket aces, and that that's it really. Um, I didn't think there were that many aces in his range. So I didn't view it as a scare card and I tried to go for value as well as try to polarize my range. Moral of the story, don't be greedy. Actually, the other moral of the story is, so I made this decision and then I posted this hand in a chat group that I'm in. Um, it's just some other poker nerds. Actually, the name is Vegas Poker Nerds. And I asked them what they all thought. Um, and pretty much everyone said pretty similar things that I should have gone smaller um, or even considered checking. I dislike checking, I do like betting small though, and I do think I fucked up this hand. That being said, in game, when I got to, like when I made each of these decisions, I made my pre-flop decision, which ended up being good. I made my flop decision, which ended up being good. I made my turn decision, which ended up being good. I made my river decision, which ended up being bad. However, my logic in all of these decisions were pretty much the exact same. I, I think the way that I was thinking about this hand in game was accurate and correct. I still fucked up the hand, even though my logic was spot on in every single type of spot. I just wanted to talk to him and make a really important note on that exact point. You know, playing a hand with sound logic and reasoning is very different from playing the hand optimally or correctly. And I think a lot of times we kind of meld those two things into one uh, when they are, in fact, very different. You can play a hand with amazing reasoning, uh, very sound logic, but it's still technically incorrect. Um, and you can play a hand correctly and get to that, incorrect, you know, that, that correct play with incorrect logic. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what makes poker simultaneously so awesome and frustrating. A lot of spots in poker are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly complex. And you can approach them with really good theory and really good logic and still completely and totally butcher them and not be aware of it. So for me, the moral of this hand history is Surround yourself with people that are as passionate about the game as you are, and you will give yourself an incredible resource to build and grow as a poker player and as a person and to try to have success in this game and industry, which is very, very, very difficult. That being said, thank you very much for watching this hand history. Stay safe and healthy out there, and best of luck at the tables.